Hello, I'm Eric Corman, Communications Director at League of Education Voters and a parent of a seventh grader of color in the public school system who is accessing special education services. This webinar features closed captions. In order to access captioning, just click on the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen. Spanish interpretation is also available. To access this webinar in Spanish, in your webinar controls at the bottom of your screen, click interpretation, which is the icon that looks like a globe, then click Spanish. And if you want to hear only Spanish without the original English in the background, click mute original audio. Special thanks to Claudia Hazar, who is our interpreter. If you have any technical issues, feel free to use the chat function, which I will monitor throughout the webinar. In case you're not familiar with us, League of Education is a statewide nonprofit that works with families, educators, and leaders to build a brighter future for every Washington student. Our website is educationvoters.org. We believe that education is a tool for justice. One of the systems that perpetuate racial injustice experienced by communities of color is our schools. We believe every child deserves an excellent public education that provides equitable opportunities for success. In order to achieve this, we must pursue radical change in our school systems for equity, justice, and liberation. We must build schools and systems that honor the humanity of every student. Welcome to our free online webinar series, Lunchtime Webinars. We started this series nearly eight years ago to share information and build knowledge on important and timely issues. Today's webinar features Washington State Teachers of the Year on what students need for the 2021-22 school year. These are unprecedented times in Washington State. In the 2021-22 school year, school districts are offering a mix of in-person and virtual learning options. But how is this third year of the COVID-19 pandemic impacting students? And how can we best support them now? We are honored to have Washington State Teachers of the Year, Jared Kep from 2022, Brooke Brown from 2021, Amy Campbell from 2020, Robert Hand from 2019, Mandy Manning from 2018 and the 2018 National Teacher of the Year, Nate Bowling joining us via video from 2016, and Lion Terry from 2015 with us. Camille Jones from 2017 was scheduled to be here, but seven classes in her school in the Quincy School District had to be put in quarantine, including a kindergarten class just yesterday. So she has to support the teachers with their tech needs. Also, the Teachers of the Year will be joined by students from the Washington State Legislative Youth Advisory Council, also known as LIAC. And I'll introduce those students now. Israel Lopez is a junior at Cedro Woolley High School and going to Skagit Valley College with Running Start. He was appointed to the Legislative Youth Advisory Council in 2021 by Washington State Lieutenant Governor Denny Heck. He has served as a campaign manager for county level campaigns and has been an advisor to Skagit County Commissioners. All his life, his number one goal has been to help improve the day-to-day -day lives of everyone. He plans to attend the University of Washington and major in nursing. Max Mulgard is a senior at Mount Spokane High School, resides in the 7th Legislative District, and is a second-year member to LIAC. As an advocate for educational equity, Max has a long history of community service and academic achievement that includes debate, volunteering with his church community, and more. Max is excited to collaborate with his peers to ensure that the youth voice is heard in the state legislature. In this webinar, the Washington State Teachers of the Year will share what they're hearing from students, families, and colleagues in their community on how the start of the 2021-22 school year is going, and what they recommend that students need now. Students with LIAC will offer feedback. If time permits, we'll also have time for questions and answers. A couple of housekeeping items before we begin. You'll notice a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. This will be the space for you to submit questions to us if we have time. We hope to have some time at the end after the panel discussion wraps up. As always, feel free to send any feedback about the webinar quality to us on the chat function or at info at educationvoters.org. And speaking of the chat function, you're welcome to use it to check in and comment on anything you hear. Welcome Israel, Max, Washington State Teacher of the Year, Jared Kep from North Thurston Public Schools, 2021 Washington State Teacher of the Year, Brooke Brown from the Franklin Pierce School District, 
2020 Washington State Teacher of the Year Amy Campbell from the Camas School District. 2019 Washington State Teacher of the Year Robert Hand from the Mount Vernon School District. 2018 Washington State Teacher of the Year and 2018 National Teacher of the Year Mandy Manning, now with the Washington Education Association. 2016 Washington State Teacher of the Year Nate Bowling, now teaching abroad in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. And 2015 Washington State Teacher of the Year Lion Terry, now an assistant principal at Highline Public Schools. All right, what are you hearing from students, families, and colleagues in your community on how the start of the school year is going? And I'm going to call on Jared because you are new to this panel and I can't wait to hear what you're hearing. Well, I'm hearing a lot of different things uh, from a lot of different people, and it varies a lot by grade. So there's a few common themes that I'm seeing and hearing a lot, mostly from the students. And a lot of it is that desire and need to rebuild and reconnect and sort of remember what it's like to flourish within that sense of community that we've all needed so much. Um, and so they're looking for opportunities to kind of come together and have meaningful experiences again. And from an academic side, I would say that given our tumultuous last couple of years, that I'm seeing more and more students wanting to engage in uh, more deep and meaningful conversations and learning uh, that reflects the world that they're living in and the education they're going to need to be leaders in it. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I'd, I'd like to uh, pop on over to Mandy to hear what things are like in Spokane, but I also want to say I'll be watching your mute. So if, uh, if you unmute, just feel free to pop in at any time. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and call on someone. <laughs> but Mandy, yes, what's happening in Spokane? Uh, well, in Spokane, you know, we're all back in school and there's been a lot of quarantine happening, but I think just in general, everybody is happy to have started the year um, in person with students in the classroom. Um, there's still a lot of, I don't know what the right word is, trepidation, <laughs> nervousness, uh, a lot of uh, there's just still so much uncertainty and we all keep hoping that this is the end of what we're going through, but then it seems to be then the beginning again. <laughs> and it's just so tumultuous that we're seeing a lot of um, earlier burnout than, than, than we are used to, I think. So we're starting the year exhausted already. Um, and I think that that's for both students and, and uh, educators, and for definitely for parents as well and community. Um, and, and there's so much division still within uh, every single grouping of people that it's causing um, a lot of factors. You know, normally, you know, you go into your classroom and you teach your students and you focus on what's going on, but there's so much happening that it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, infiltrating what's going on in the, in the classroom because you can't help but be impacted by the social situation outside of the room. Um, and so I think that there's just a lot of happiness that we're together, but uh, so much is unknown. So much ambiguity. Ambiguity is the word that I'm looking for. And things change like on a dime. So it's, it's, it's been, I, I, it, you can tell by how I'm answering this question that there's no, there's no like just specific, everybody feels this way. <laughs> it just doesn't exist right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. I'd like to go over to Brooke and uh, Brooke, you're over in Franklin Pierce, which is by Tacoma. What are you hearing and saying? Yeah, uh, I would just, echo both what Jared and Mandy had to say is that um, we're all experiencing different levels of difficulty. Um, I'm a parent of an elementary and a high schooler now and a recent graduate. And so um, this is impacting even our recent grads, um, thinking about the all employees, not just certificated um, teachers, but thinking about our nurses and our para educators and just everyone um, is really um, 
just coming back, usually the summer is such a time of rest and is such a time of um, rejuvenation and, and healing and we come back ready to go. And I think everyone has come back um, ready to see kids, but is um, every day um, just really coming from, giving from a place that um, their vessels are not full. And so, um, and I think kids are in the same situation um, and so when Mandy was saying, you know, burnout is already happening, um, I'm very concerned um, for our, our educators and our kids and really thinking about what are the different um, types of care and support that we can really um, offer teachers and students during this time, because it, it's really, it's really challenging on so many, so many different layers. Yeah, I'd like yeah, to I can echo that. And sorry, uh, I have to be, I'm traveling for a family uh, engagement. So I may, uh, may, I'm in an airport, um, but I will echo that I'm hearing from parents and colleagues, especially that safety, safety, safety is the number one thing, right? And if we can say to them, hey, you're gonna be safe when you, you come here and your kids are gonna be safe when they come here and we can show it by the systems we put in place and by the ways we're um, you know, addressing their safety concerns, then they're going to be ready to learn, but you know, and that's always the case about school. That you know, we, if we take care of them socially and emotionally and physically, then they're going to be ready to learn. But this year, it's even more so, right? You know, that they they need to know that our safety plans matter to us, and that they you know that we're going to care you know deeply about kids who are sick in our building and how we're going to address those concerns, and we're going to care deeply about distancing and masking and all of those things. Then they're going to come to school, um, you know, ready to you know, let some of that go and let some of that stress go. And I see the same thing with colleagues and, and teachers in my school is that it's a stressful time to be teaching. And, but once they know that, you know, everybody in the community is taking these precautions safely, then they're ready to get, uh, you know, back into the stuff that they really want to be doing, which is focusing on the learn, teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, how about up north in Mount Vernon? Robert, what are you seeing and hearing? Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of the same stuff that, that all of these um, fine folks have said before me. I mean, it's, it's difficult um, coming back and, and not knowing really what to expect. Uh, and, you know, I remember when we were remote, uh, hearing from so many kids how uh, they, it's one of those ideas that you, you don't really know what you have until you don't have it. And kids, a lot of times before we were remote and when things were, you know, normal, whatever that means, um, you know, they, they, a lot of times, you know, you'd hear from kids all like, oh, I just, I don't want to be here. And it can, you know, kind of would take their education for granted at times. Uh, and when we went remote, you know, they started realizing like, okay, we, we actually had it pretty good. And now that we see that we don't get to have that, we, we miss it, you know? And uh, it's, it's, um, it's interesting to see that mentality as kids are coming back onto campus and adults coming back onto campus. I mean, any of us can take for granted what's in front of us and, and realize that when we don't have it anymore. And so I think we're all just grateful for the opportunities that are in front of us and grateful to have that back. Um, and, and at the same time, it still is a challenge, right? Because uh, it's been a long time uh, since any of us have had a full uninterrupted regular school year. Uh, there's been an interesting graphic that's been floating around that a lot of uh, people in education have shared that talks about the last full uninterrupted school year that kids have had based on their grade level. Um, and so if you look at seniors right now, I teach ninth through 12th grade at, at Mount Vernon High School and our seniors that we have right now, their last full inter uninterrupted school year was ninth grade, their first year of high school. Their 10th and 11th grade was interrupted. Their senior year now is, I mean, it's back, but it's it's modified in a lot of ways, right? And, uh, and it, you know, looking all the way down the grade levels, I, I have my own daughter that's a freshman um, starting high school this year. Uh, she's still at a mid-high, but it's, you know, it's still her freshman year. And, I mean, the mid-high is two years, and she, she hasn't even really been there. Um, and so kind of looking at what her experience is and looking at that idea that her last full uninterrupted school year was sixth grade. Uh, when she was in her first year of middle school. So I think just all of us kind of keeping that in mind as we come back and like, yes, focusing on academics and, and trying to help kids and meet what meet them where, where they are and, and get them, you know, up to speed with whatever we need to do. But, but just remembering that we're, we're all people and, you know, we're in the business of people. And uh, that's been the, the, the biggest thing that we've really been trying to make a concerted effort to focus on here is just welcoming everybody back with open open arms uh, from a distance, of course, uh, and and just trying to to recreate this like magical environment where 
you know, everybody, uh, you know, feels like they have a home to be, to be safe and welcome and, and learn. Like it's, it's, it's a big task, but we're all here doing it together. And I think everybody's just glad that we are able to do that again. Yeah. Yeah. Amen to that. So uh, we'll go to Amy and then we'll play a clip from Nate Bowling and then Max and Israel will be your turn. So Amy, what are you seeing down South in Camas, especially in the world of special ed? Yeah. Um, so the, it's, it's interesting. I, I, what I'm seeing, I think I work with students with moderate to profound impact from disability and, and I'm pretty, and I'm connected to um, some of the disability community in Southwest Washington. It's been hard. Um, some students had the opportunity to do in-person learning last year, but it obviously wasn't the same as um, what we'd done, like Nate had mentioned previously a few years ago. And so I think there's um, families and students are coming with high expectations. They've heard a lot, you know, social media or media in general talking about learning loss. And there is that inherent fear. Did we lose something? And if, if we did, what was it? And how do we recoup that? I think also um, all, someone mentioned all families have the not, a, a fear of getting sick. And, and I think student, there are some students who are more vulnerable. They don't understand social distance or they can't physically wear masks. How do we protect our most vulnerable students and provide them these inclusive experiences that we know as we're talking about building community in our school and how valuable that is to reconnect? Um, how do we ensure that all students are getting access to these community spaces that are, that are valuable? Um, I think there's a lot of big emotions for staff, students, families that are coming. And, and I think that um, it is the fear, it's the expectations, it's the desire to, to teach and learn and build community, it's a lot. And, and what I, I just keep holding um, is that we need to make sure we're keeping grace. I think the next question is what do we need to do? But I skipped ahead <laughs> and keeping grace for all of that and just remembering we're coming out of something very traumatic into a space with each other and how do we greet each other and be with each other and build each other up um, as we're all pretty exhausted trying to figure out what this year actually is. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. I'm excited to hear what these um, students have to say too. Yeah, thank you so much, Amy. My, uh, my controls are frozen a little bit so I can't share my screen to uh, get Nate's clip at the moment. Even though I'm 7,500 miles away from home, I feel I'm connected in both places. And I'm hearing from my teaching community in Tacoma and also folks here in Abu Dhabi. Uh, frankly, we lost some really good educators over the summer and some folks who I think are really uh, good for kids and were great pedagogues resigned from their, from their positions. And so there's gonna be a reckoning after this pandemic is over about the folks that we left in the classroom. Uh, that said, what I'm really hearing from people is, is that they feel like we are still not together on this pandemic. Uh, here in Abu Dhabi, there is a mask mandate. So like we wear masks in school, every child who's eligible is vaccinated, every staff member is eligible is vaccinated. And I feel like we're in it together. Uh, I don't feel like people back home are in the same boat. And like, obviously the people watching this like aren't the problem. Like the people watching this care about these issues, but there's lots of communities where people like aren't on board with this and aren't on board. And it's, it's interesting to like call somebody like pro COVID. Like, I, don't, I don't think people are pro COVID, but there are some people who aren't grappling with the reality of how disrupting this is. Uh, I have juniors and I have uh, ninth graders and it's just like we're entering our third year of interruption and more than anything that like students, students and teachers need adults and policymakers to have their stuff together. And like, I don't feel like we're there yet. And I don't know what it's going to take for people to get to, to people to get stuff together, but like, we're just not there yet. And there's all sorts of things like, I believe that at some point this year, many districts around Washington state are going to be going remote for a period of time. And so like, do we have rural broad broadband figured out? Do we have a mechanism for instruction and delivery figured out? Uh, one of the things that I've seen back home is that the city of Seattle, Seattle Public Schools has lost basically 2000 students to either neighboring districts or to homeschooling or to just like some other option. And so like what we have not gotten to the point where we're ready to respond to the needs of people and offer the options and flexibility that they need. And like, that is just a point of urgency for me that like, we need to be responding to this as the crisis that it is. I think we're all hoping that this year is normal and that it goes well and we're back in person, but that's not going to be the reality. And we need to, ready to grapple with that. Okay, there we go. Let's see. There if we go. I'd like to go to Israel and Max just to hear your feedback on what you've been hearing from the teachers and, and also what you're hearing in, in your schools and from your peers. Israel, would you like to go first? 
Sure. So um, first of all, Eric, thank you so much for having me and everyone else. Thank you so, so much for being here. Um, it's great to see all of these amazing voices coming together, discussing what we as students need in this crazy school year. So of course, teen mental health has always been an issue that we've all had on our minds. And I feel like COVID has made it even more prevalent in our education system, in our day-to-day -day lives. And one thing I am seeing in my school district is an increase in social anxiety, of which almost all of us have had a little bit of social anxiety, whether it's being on this meeting today, whether it's talking to a stranger at your local Starbucks, we all have that little bit of social anxiety. But in schools, it's way more prevalent because you interact with your peers on an hourly basis, even a minute basis, who knows? And normally what we would do to solve this issue is speak to our counselor, in which may help sometimes, sometimes the issue is more internal. And what we're seeing is a lack of therapists, providers to help combat this issue. And I'll address that on the what do we need to do section, but it's definitely an issue that we're seeing with a lack of providers to help with such a complex issue, a, not issue, a complex topic. Why don't we say that? Uh, because it needs long-term care. This can't be finished by watching a simple YouTube video on how to be calm during school. This has to be done by a trained specialized provider in which can help you throughout the duration you need care. Um, but that's one of the big things I'm hearing in my community. I'd like to pass it on to Max. Awesome, thanks Israel. I'd first like to echo what Israel was saying, um, which is, yeah, youth mental health is is a huge thing and, and has been a huge priority of LIAX for, for a lot of time. We actually passed a bill last year that was that was written by LIAC um, and and related to youth mental health. Um, and so that's been a huge, huge priority for us. Um, but uh, I'd just like to touch on what what sort of I've been hearing in Spokane and at my school, um, which which I guess is sort of an an overall feeling of exhaustion <laughs> uh, in a sense. Uh, Robert put it a great way where he was he was talking about the the last time uh, students have had uninterrupted school years. Um, and he mentioned that the last time a senior has had uninterrupted school year was as a freshman. Um, and that's that's the situation that I'm in. I am a senior this year. And so uh, at this point, it's been it's been a majority of my high school experience has been pandemic related, right? Um, and so it's just a lot of, because it's been so, so long so far. Um, but in addition to that, I would, I would note that I feel like a lot of students are ready to get back to what we had before. Um, obviously, not in the same in the same way because that's not possible uh, with health restrictions and things like that. But I sort of have the sense that people don't want to just roll over and let the students like me, like seniors who have had this pandemic. Um, control their lives for so many years, be it an inherent disadvantage educationally because of this pandemic, right? We, we, I've seen so many, you know, exceptions and, and, and sort of things and, you know, grades don't really count for this time or, or it's okay or, or all these things that happen so frequently are, are pandemic related and, and are reasonable. But I feel like at this point, we can't just allow students to be at an inherent educational disadvantage and continue to make exceptions for them because of it. And so I sort of just have the sense that we need to get back to where students are learning again. And we're, we're doing those things that make the high school experience um, and, and just the educational experience in, in general so, um, so special, um, so yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. Thank you so much, Max and Israel. I really appreciate your comments. And yeah, that does take us into, okay, what do students need now? What do we need to do? And uh, I'd like to, to start with Robert, just because I know, Robert, you got to leave at one o'clock. So yeah, if you could tell us from your perspective in Mount Vernon, what do students need right now? 
Yeah, and uh, I mean, I, I that's perfect timing after after Max. That was uh, you know well said. I appreciate the comments. Um, I, I think students need, and I, and I've always said this: we just need more more of it now than ever before. But but I mean, a, a good balance of of learning and academic you know content and and challenges uh, to their mind and and whatnot. Like yeah, that's that's part of why we're here is to to learn a ton of stuff together. I mean, not just the students learning, but us learning alongside them uh you know from each other and so i think all of us are craving that right after the last couple of years we're all craving being back in a classroom and being academically challenged by each other uh students and, and educators alike uh and at the same time uh that we're finding a way to do that and also balancing um all of the the social needs that all of us have uh both students and educators um it's it's been a, a difficult uh um, thing to to be able to come back and adapt to things after having missed out on that process over the last couple of years. Like we were talking about, um, you know, that that phase that you go through in in, um, in middle school, for instance, that all the stuff that you experience socially, uh, like, you know, dating for the first time, fighting with your friends and going through all of that stuff and just having those experiences that we learn from in those different stages of life when we're growing up, that these kids have, have wholly missed out on. And coming back uh, it, it totally in a different uh, setting coming back as a senior and not have having had that experience or my daughter coming back as a ninth grader and not having had that social experience since since really sixth grade um, I think that we need to find ways to provide opportunities for kids to explore that obviously in a safe way um, with as many things in class and out of class as we can provide for them to have safe social experiences and kind of readapt to this environment um, after having you know grown up more for the last couple of years as well um, and then, you know, just figuring out ways to support them, uh, you know, learning um, some of the boundaries that, that we're struggling with where, you know, kids over the last couple of years have struggled uh, with remote learning and disconnecting from other things at times. And now that we're back in this environment, we're finding that they're having a harder time um, finding the balance between those things. And, and, you know, it was mentioned earlier that we have to give grace and if we ever needed grace, uh, either to be, you know, shown to us or to be given to others, uh, now is the time that we need to do that. I think that kind of getting, you know, back to, to what we need to do a little bit slowly at the beginning, giving kids a little bit of space and time to kind of get used to all this again, but also continuing to provide them the support and the push um, when needed as well to get where they, you know, ultimately need and want to go. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a tall task, right? It's I mean, I'm still trying to figure it out every day. How do I, how do I find that balance? But, um, you know, all I can do is, is adapt. It's kind of my, my word of the year right now is just adapt, man. Like, you, you know, how you did things before might be different than how you're doing them now, but the idea behind it is, is still the same. It's that we have this environment and this opportunity, uh, to, to support and, and, and be there for these kids academically and socially, um, for whatever it is they need. And right now the needs are, are, I mean, both the same and quite different. So we just have to figure out how to adapt every single day when new challenges face us uh, and be able to, to, to put these kids' needs uh, first. And I mean, you know, our, our own as well, because we can't help, you know, if we're not, you know, taking care of ourselves. But I just, uh, I appreciate all of you. I'm sorry that I have to jump off, but I get the, uh, <laughs> the opportunity to go and be with my kids and, and teach. And uh, we're going to talk about this uh, in class. It's actually my teacher prep class. So we're going to talk about this and continue the conversation. So I just uh, love and appreciate all of you so much. Thank you all. It's I, I, I'm just so happy to see you all, man. So I appreciate you all. And thanks for the time. Uh, thank you so much, Robert. Oh my gosh, it's a, such a joy to have you and such a privilege to have you. And, and yes, please say hi to the kids for us. All right, will do. Thank you. And thank you students as well for being here. You're all awesome. All right. Well, I'd like to go to Brooke next. Uh, Brooke, down in, in the Tacoma area, what should we do for students now? What do they need? What kinds of supports? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And I think the best way to figure out what the answer is, is to talk to our students. Um, because the students in Tacoma um, might not have the same needs as the students in um, Camas or in Spokane. And so I think really taking the time um, to develop those relationships with our students and to really get to know them. Um, something that I think is really important is to 
is that my students always understand that they are more to me than what they can produce. And so, yes, we are going to do um, academics in class. Yes, we are going to have rigorous um, academic experiences together. But at the end of the day, the most important thing um, that I want my students to know is that I care about them, that I care about um, where they're headed and their goals. And so I think it's really important, especially during this time, that we take the um, the time to really build those relationships that we take the time to get to know our students. And also, I think, um, to really help carry the load um, for each other. And so one of the things I think in this time is that this added, um, sort of, I don't want to say challenge, because that's not the word I'm looking for, but like this charge to check in on every kid every day. And so what does that look like in your classes every single day um, to have a check-in? Um, that's just how are you and, and noticing patterns. If you notice a kid that's, um, that's, that's normally, you know, gives a lower rating, then um, maybe the concern is not as great, but if they're uh, usually higher and they're significantly lower, then really checking in and having those individual conversations um, because we know that uh, mental health is real, that we're all experiencing different levels of trauma and really making sure um, that every kid is being checked on every day. And then also having check-ins where you're just like, hey, get to know each other. Like, what music are you listening to? What's your favorite kind of pizza? Like, does pineapple belong on pizza? It absolutely does, right? So all of those really important things um, that we can get to know about our, our kids. Um, and then I think it, that helps us get back to the joy um, I, our kids need more joy. We need more joy. And really thinking about how um, centering joy every day doesn't mean we're always happy. It doesn't mean that we're suppressing how we feel. It doesn't mean that um, we're ignoring what's going around us. But when we are pursuing joy, then we can remember and be grateful um, for the smaller things. And, and that helps us get through the difficult times together. So for educators, how are you pursuing joy? So then you can model it for your students because you deserve to have joy and our kids deserve to have joy. And so what does that look like to build that every day in our classrooms? Wow, I love that. <laughs> I'd like to go to Jared next. Uh, in North Thurston schools, what kinds of supports do you think that students need right now? What are you hearing? What are you seeing? Well, generally speaking, um, it, it would be pretty much everything that's already been addressed, right? Um, a lot of that, that personal connection with um, caring, respons responsible adults in their lives. It's really about making sure that we have more access to mental health support. Um, we, I mean, the, the, the whole crisis has really put a bright light on the lack of availability of resources and the equity to access of resources of a lot of our students um, to kind of to get that to have the necessary supports to be able to thrive while they're at school, especially as, as we are returning and you know we're we're hoping for uh, a brighter future um, in the process. Um, and I think to kind of add on to some of what Brooke was saying uh, in my in my regular routine as, as a native student specialist. Uh, a lot of what we've been doing has just been traveling the district and either pulling, you know, small groups of students or just walking in on a class and, and, and having a check in with the students to say, hey, we're, we're here. Um, you know, here's a snack, a bottle of water. It's like this is where you can find us. Um, if you're having a great day, we'd love to hear about it. If you're having a bad day, let us know. We want to come by and be there for you. So it's a lot of a lot of it's about making those connections and reminding people that while we can still feel anxious and isolated, that uh, there are still lots of people around uh, who care and who are looking out for each other. And it just, it's that sense that, you know, community is what helps heal the land. You know, it's, it, it's what provides the foundation for all good things to grow. And I think the more that we can look, look to each other as, as fellow humans going through a common struggle, then we can lean on each other for that for that that common hope for uh, for a more sustainable and I, I think uh, fulfilling future as we get there. Um, and as far as what you know, specific students need that that varies quite a bit. The 
in my experience, a lot of it is just it's it's about having opportunities to come and, and just have a space. And I think one thing that our program is able to do is by being able to be a direct student support program, we can actually provide that space. So if a, if a student is just getting overwhelmed in that transitional return back to school, then they know they can come and see us. And, you know, it was like, hey, let's you can come into our office. Uh, we can go sit in the commons. We can just kind of wind down a little bit and recollect ourselves uh, before we go back and sort of like build up and lean into our resilience even more. And so I think just realizing that this isn't going to be just like flipping a switch and it's all back the way it was. Um, everything that we had went to sleep. And, you know, sometimes it takes a while for that stuff to wake up again. Um, but all those great strengths and resources are, are still within our students. And as Brooke mentioned, too, like they're within us, too. And we have to remember that as adults because uh, the, the burnout and the wear and tear is real. So we kind of have to maintain, maintain and remind each other the importance of that, that self-care as we move forward. Yeah, Mandy, would you like to comment on on your perspective from Spokane? I, I know you're connected to a lot of educators through the WEA, so I'm, I'm sure you've been hearing a lot about about what students need and what what could be very helpful right now. Yeah. Um, so everything that everyone has said so far is exactly like my thoughts as well. I I I, I just keep thinking about that. Um, sometimes we are a one size fits all kind of you know, education is a sort of a one size fits all thing. And, and I really appreciate what both Jared and Brooke said about individualizing and recognizing that not, not every school community and every community within a school needs the exact same thing. And so prioritizing speaking with students and, and really getting to know, but not only that, educators as well, and the educators that are working with each of the students, because we, it, as it rightfully should be, we focus a lot on what students need, but we, in order for educators to be effective, we also need to be able to focus on what educators need. And we need whole educators to be able to help students be whole. And so we definitely need to create space for educators to also go through what they're going through. Um, we need to be creating space for all things, not only academic things, but emotional things. Um, and it's going to be a roller coaster. Every class is going to be a roller coaster. There's going to be times when students are, um, and educators are having experiences of, you know, last year we were on a computer looking at each other. This year we're face to face. I don't really know how to, I myself am having a lot of anxiety just about anything. Um, and, you know, my own child had COVID last week. And like, I, I mean, there's just things being thrown at us all the time. We need transparency and honesty. Like there is no guarantee about anything right now. And the fact that a lot of districts have just abandoned their remote learning process instead of thinking about that, you know, maybe we should be really considering how we continue those kinds of things in case something happens, or maybe blending and integrating and figuring out how we can get kids used to and teachers used to not only doing things remotely, but also doing things in person so that we can be better at adjusting. Um, and then the and then just being honest, honest in everything, right? Uh, we talk a lot about honesty in education. That means a lot of things right now, um, but kids need that more than ever right now. They need honesty in their curriculum and they just need honesty about what's going on socially and with the pandemic and with our structures. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to mention was honoring the strengths and the gains because we focus so much on what's been lost. And I'm gonna put lost in um, quotes because a lot of the benchmarks and things and standards that we say kids need to accomplish or be at are arbitrary and they have been decided on by people not in this environment right now. <laughs> uh, and so we need to recognize that while it has cost us a lot, what has happened over the last three years, we've also gained a lot. We've gained a lot of adaptability. We've gained a lot of, um, you know, just figuring out how to use our brains in a different way, how to interact with each other in a different way. 
Um, and I think that we need to honor that. We don't need to focus just on what we're missing, but on you know the wholeness of us and, and, and the, the great things that we have gone through. And look, here we are, we're still plugging along. Um, and so those are the biggest things that I can think of that we all need and, um, and we all need those things. We all need those things. Yeah, uh, I may have to go here shortly, but uh, I would just to build on what Mandy was saying, you know, like the, um, you know, we have to make sure we're taking care of our people, like our kids and our, uh, our adults in our building to, you know, what to what Jared and, and Brooke were saying as well. Um, but also remember that, you know, like in an elementary school, you know, I'm one of the only ones here, you know, works every day in an elementary school, we have second graders who basically have never had kind of grown up relationships before you know, relationships away from their parents and, you know, teaching them and reminding them of, you know, that those skills matter and working with teacher, you know, adults in the building to remind them that those skills are really important and valuable for them. And it's so, it's such a joy watching them grow those relationships and grow those uh, situations. And I just think our students need us to remember, you know, that they, are, they, do, they do need to have these experiences, these social interactions with one another that are, super valuable for them as human beings, as whole human beings, you know, and in the same way, I, I think, you know, for adults and for kids, it's really important for us to remember that during the pandemic teaching, um, we had to give up a lot of the things that we often do in schools. Yeah. We had to shed much of the kind of fluff, I like to call it, that, um, that we often put into schools. And I, I, I worry about putting it back in because I want, our education to be rigorous to what Brooke was saying. And I want it to be culturally relevant to the individuals who are in our, in our schools and in our buildings and, you know, like, you know, tailored to the individuals we have. And we just need to remember that it's okay. We need to give our, our adults in our building permission to shed some of that stuff and focus on the people in front of them and have that education be a culturally relevant one. That's when we get buy-in from our kids. That's when it matters to them when they know that we know them and that they know that, you know, we care about who they are and, and their culture and their, you know, their whole humanness and what their strengths are, then, you know, then they're going to have buy-in. And then that's when, that's when kids learn, right? Is when they know we care about them and that they know that we um, know them as individuals and as cultural human beings. So I think, you know, we just need to remember that um, it's okay to focus on those things and, you know, sometimes we can give up some of the uh, other stuff that maybe is not necessarily connecting with who our students are as people. Mm -hmm. But um, thank you all. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, I, I, I will go to Amy in a second. And then Israel and Max, it'll be your turn. This uh, in the recording, this is where I will drop in Nate's comments, because my screen controls are still frozen. So I'm glad we're still able to do this. So this is great. More than anything right now, students need some structure and predictability, and students need for adults to have plans for what's going to happen. What is going to be the response when there are cases at a school? What is going to be the protocols for online learning? Is online learning going to be delivered more effectively this time? Like we've had 18 months of lessons we should have learned. Like students need dynamic instruction, whether they're online or in person. And honestly, more than anything, there's thousands of kids around the state and frankly, millions of kids around the country who have just fallen through the cracks and have vanished from schools. And we need to get them back into schools. And when I say back into schools, that doesn't mean back into school, like in a building necessarily, but back in a formal educational system. Uh, in particular with low income schools and low income communities, there's a lot of families that had a choice between online online learning and work and shows work. How do we reintegrate those kids? And then the other thing I would say is, is that I continue to be concerned about high school seniors getting the advising and guidance they need about college education and college choices. Uh, I have worked with high school students for 11 years now, and I know how critical the choices that students make are now, and they're not getting the advice and the counseling they would normally get about financial aid. Um, they're not getting the advice that they would need about course selection for higher ed and their options. And so like, like the adults, at this moment need to step and make sure the kids are engaged and make sure kids are taken care of and not let kids fall through the cracks. Like far too many children, far too many students have fallen through the cracks over the last 18 months. And like, we, we have to be held accountable for that. And here's the thing is that parents have options and parents are going to choose other options. And if they choose other options, we failed them. Like that's, that's our fault. We've done it to ourselves. Like we have to be better. Systems have to be better. Teachers have to be better. Schools have to be better. Like we all have to be better. This is not like a, oh, it's your fault or it's your fault. Like the blame is on all of us. We have to be better system-wide.
Amy, uh, you, you touched upon um, a little bit about what we can do moving forward, but anything else you'd like to add to what students need now? I am always in, uh, impressed by this panel. Their answers are, I think it's spot on, right? Um, the idea of, I often think about seeing each student and that is building that relationship. I think um, students uh, knowing that I, my past principal used to say students aren't yours or mine, they're ours and making sure that even if you're only seeing a student one period of the day or maybe you're a special education teacher and seeing them just for a small piece, I've really tried to prioritize for myself, making sure when I'm with that student that I am engaging and figuring out what each individual needs because each individual had such a different experience and every all the comments on how the impacts and the traumas of the last year uh, being in remote settings. I think about the students who we had who were, we were finding grace for students who were so um, fearful of being seen on a camera that they'd put band-aids over their cameras. And now we have students who had band-aids on their cameras coming back into our schools. What does that feel like? And I'm really glad that um, Israel spoke about um, mental health and anxiety because you know, they might have been nervous pre-pandemic. The pandemic affected all of us, but now we're coming back into schools. And I liked also what Mandy was commenting on. How are we, we learned so much and we talked about how much we learned during a pandemic about some students thrive in a remote setting with the technology. And we learned how to make flip grids and whether we liked it or not and use Seesaw, whether we liked it or not. And some of our students did really well um, and we were able to universally design lessons. So as we're seeing each student and what they need, how are we making sure we're reflecting on what, what worked well for you last year, if anything, and how do we continue to build that into our programming so that um, we're growing? We don't, we talked about, we don't wanna go back to old normal. What does that mean um, in the way we see and serve each of our students and make sure that, they, that we meet their needs and part of that means building on what felt good for them in the past and utilizing the technologies um, that that supported. So let's hear from the, the kid or the students. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Amy. Yeah, uh, Israel, Max, uh, it's your turn. Uh, you feel free to comment on what you heard. Feel free to suggest uh, from your own experience or experiences of your peers. What do students need right now? Max, I'll let you go first this time. All right, thanks. <laughs> I uh, I loved I loved what all the all the educators here were saying about connection uh, and, and about connecting with students. Uh, Brooke was talking about the the daily check ins and and things like that, and 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 I love that as 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 something uh, that a student can have. Um, but I also I love when when connection turns to incredible intangible action. Uh, and, and so when, when an educator can take the things they know about a student, those daily check-ins, and they can say, you're passionate about this, you're passionate about this, or you have these issues and takes them to, to, to new realms. And, and, I, and I think that, that that is incredibly important for a student to truly not just know that they're being talked to, but to know that they're heard. Um, and so that takes the form of action. I, I, I haven't have a lot of uh, great teachers at Mount Spokane uh, where I live and a lot of great counselors and, and people like that who have sort of had a lot of like my passions. I'm a big, I'm a big extracurricular guy, I'm a big club guy. And so I have this and like, I, I had the science team before school. I have our history bowl team after school. And then I'm in the play rehearsal after that. So like, I have a lot of, I have a lot of things that I do, but all of those things have been enabled by educators, by, by our, our drama coach, by our, our history teachers and, and our science teachers being listening and being willing to try things. We are in a point of the pandemic now that is scary, but it is the point where we really need to try things. And we really need to, to get out and be willing to just try those things that we love and that we are passionate about. Um, 
for those people like me that are seniors in high school, it's one of the few times in years that we've been able to do anything. And it may not look the same. It may not be the same, but we have to be willing to try. Um, so that's, that's what I love from educators. Um, that's, those are the things that the educators that have made the largest impact on me in my life have been willing to do, which is to listen to me and take that and be willing to try and, and try something new and, and make it impactful for me, for my friends, for all the other students uh, here at our school. Yeah, thank you, Max. Yeah, Israel, um, we, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you, um, Max. To touch on what you said, where can we build the most tangible and person-to-person -person change in your building? You as educators have the power to connect with students on an individual level. We can make all the policy we want on a state level. This will not affect how you as educators, leaders in your building, will connect with your students. That is what students need the most out of anything. A great educator, such as yourselves, can change the life of a student. That is one thing I will always live by. That is one thing that I hope many teachers can live by because that person to person, that connection with a staff member, any staff member, it doesn't need to be their teacher, is crucial in any learning environment. You feel the love, you feel the passion. When a teacher has such a strong passion, a student is gonna feel that and feel that motivation. And that's one thing I've personally experienced in my like years of being in school. Um, but that's one huge thing. And another, just being able to, to touch on what, um, I believe it was Jared, on access to resources. Um, me personally, I've been on a wait list for about three months to see, on five wait lists to see a therapist because I do need it. And I can personally admit that because it's an issue that many teens in my area are struggling with. And these are the only five local therapists in my area that take my insurance. I can only imagine how it could be for those who don't have insurance or those who don't have as advanced insurance as mine, um, but because mine is from my mom's work. And the closest one with openings is almost 45 minutes away in Everett. How can a low class, low income, middle class family drive 45 minutes to see a therapist for an hour, or you're going to wait almost three to five months on a wait list with no guarantee of a spot by the time you come. That is one thing that we definitely long down the road or shortly needs to be addressed because access to resources. That is a huge, huge topic and issue that needs to be addressed in Washington State. Um, and that's even more prevalent during COVID. People, there is a lack of providers because most people don't see the great, amazing work that providers can do. It's crazy how impactful their work is and how unnoticed it is. It's it's crazy, but that's my thoughts. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Israel. I really appreciate that. Yeah, we have a few more minutes here. I mean, not 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 very many, but I just wanted to give uh, the teachers an opportunity to respond to the the students, or if you have any last words. This is where I'm going to drop in last words from Nate in the recording. It's my sincere hope that on the backside of all of this, that we can sit down and have a real conversation about what we want the purpose of public schools to be in Washington State. Uh, over the last decade, there's been many conversations about education being the paramount duty of Washington State and the state government. And this moment of COVID has shown me that like, we're not 
all there on that being a paramount duty. Like we need to treat this like it's the essential service that the state provides because it is. And the children in Washington schools are too valuable to be failed by the adults like they are being right now. And again, this is not teacher blaming. It's not about what's happening in classroom instructions. This is about systems. Like the systems from districts to ESDs to OSBI to the State Board of Education, like we've all come up short on this and we have to come together afterwards and do better. I can't see whether or not you're muting or not muting because my controls are still frozen. So feel free to just popcorn in. I'm just going to step back. I, I would just add um, like yes to all of the brilliance that has been shared. And I just want to kind of come back to a, a comment that Amy made earlier about thinking about um, sort of when things are out of our control, our first response or the response that many of us go to is to what's comfortable. And unfortunately, what's comfortable is what was previously normal, which we know was not um, working. And so I would just, and again, I'm using the word challenge, but that's not the word I'm looking for, encourage us to really think about what it looks like to really reimagine. This is also touching on what Max had shared about, you know, um, yes, it's about getting to know your students. Yes, it's about those daily check-ins, but what are you willing to do based on the feedback that you get from your students to reimagine what school can be, to reimagine what those educational experiences can be, to reimagine what learning can look like. And also touching on what Bandy said about really thinking about um, what are the strengths and the gains that our students have have gotten from the past two and a half years or how like I, the last school years that have been interrupted from COVID. Yeah, it's been so long, I can't even remember. But really looking at it and, and being asset-based and, and valuing what our students are bringing into the classroom instead of focusing on what's been lost. And again, that's about centering joy. That's about centering strength. Um, and that's about centering um, futurity and where our young people can go. And so I just think um, it's about humanizing um, our experience together. It's about um, really having grace as we are moving forward together, but really, really resisting the urge to do what's comfortable because um, that is the opposite of innovation. That is the opposite of creativity. That is the opposite of the direction that we need to go um, in the field of education in the future. It's not, our, our, kids, uh, our kids deserve more. Yeah, and just to extend that, uh, let's not fall back on standardization because sometimes that's what we tend to do. We're like, oh my gosh, everything's out of control. We need to control it to the point of making it not accessible to almost every single student. Um, and so we've been on a long, long trip of standardization, a long it's been a lot of years of us trying to uh, can everything and make it so that everybody learns the same thing at the same time. Um, and that has really stunted us. And uh, I think that the pandemic is, is an opportunity for us to, uh, for lack of a better phrase, because this is the only one that's in my mind, is blow that up and, and you know, start anew and, and figure out and reimagine, as Brooke says, uh, that uh, what, how, we, how we do things and, and what we want kids to get from school and what is the purpose of school. And I've been on so many of these webinars and I think I say the same thing every time about what, what, what do we want kids to know and be able to do once they leave? Is it inch deep curriculum or is it humans, human beings who care about their community and care about one another and take care of themselves and take care of each other? I so appreciate your candor, Israel. Uh, my daughter as well is having a heck of a time finding a counselor. We cannot find one for her and we have insurance too. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, these are things that we, we do. We tend to wanna be comfortable and comfortable doesn't necessarily mean putting kids and in, in, in the educators to teach them first. It, it means like, what, what can I do so that I don't feel out of control? Um, and discomfort is where we grow. Um, and so, Let's, let's do it differently. Let's do it differently and let's not fall back on our gut response of we, we need to fix this, so let's standardize it. Yeah, if I, if I can jump in after Mandy, um, I, I, was, I just wanna thank you so much for bringing up the importance of recognizing our gains 
Um, I feel like we're, we're still such in the midst uh, of a crisis that we, I think, lose sight of perspective of what we've been through and what we saw was coming. Um, because when we knew as, as this pandemic was approaching, I think as educators um, and, and students too, like we, we saw like, like this, this tidal wave coming. And I, I think what gets lost is that we didn't shy away from it. Like we knew it was going to be an unimaginable challenge. And we just went to where we were needed. Like we, we got to work and none of the outcomes were ever going to be really as good as we wanted them to be. Um, but we knew we were going to throw the best that we had at it to provide whatever consistency was possible given the vast disparities in resources across districts and across schools that we were, we were all trying to uh, address uh, a worldwide challenge with the tools that we had available to us. And we, we shared in that experience with our students and with our communities. And I, I, I was really, it really hit with me, like, how are we addressing the trauma? Um, as communities and recognizing um, our, accomplishment, our accomplishments that we achieved together um, and the things that we endured and what sort of beauty can we build in the future? Um, what can we learn from, you know, the, the past um, in the process? And what sort of consistency can we provide for all of us? Um, I know it's... Uh, I don't know about all of your schools, but like school schedules are still changing all the time. Um, I mean, whether it's like to modify for, um, you know, student capacity at lunches or trying to catch up on testing. Um, there's, there's still a, a lot, a lot to be desired for any, any sort of routine. So we're still very much in that high need of flexibility. Um, and I think we still got a way uh, to go before we, we can kind of feel like we're standing on solid ground. Yeah, yeah. Now I know that we're at time. So if any of you need to leave because of that, feel free. Um, but I just wanna give Amy and Max and Israel just an opportunity to have any last words before we wrap up. I would only end with um, thank you for having us and really how important it has been for me to hear from students because I think our most valuable stakeholder in this whole pandemic we need to just keep coming back to how are our students experiencing this and um, I'm here to serve my students and my community and how do I maintain my own mental health and fill my bucket so that I can um, be in community with them and Max, I I really enjoyed how your call to action. Don't just hear us, let's act on it. And um, Israel, I really did appreciate your candor too because I think um, we can't ignore the mental health concerns of today. Because they're not going away. It's bottling it up and ignoring and not having the conversation is only going to perpetuate the harm. Um, and normalizing conversations around the need for mental health care in our schools, for our staff and our students and our communities um, is the way we're going to move forward to ensure that. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Amy. Israel, Max, is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap up? Um, nothing else. I just super appreciate everyone else, everyone for being here and Eric, thank you for having us. Super appreciate it. These are such crucial conversations that need to happen. And I'm so, so happy to see that everyone here as leaders is are having those conversations. It really does mean a lot as a student and as a leader in my own community. It's awesome. Thank you, Israel. Max, is there anything else you'd like to leave it with us? I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, again, just just thank you, Eric, for, for allowing students to be here and to be able to share their voices and and just thank you to all of these clearly great teachers that are here. Um, there's one thing that I, I, I do firmly believe about education is that education and being taught and teachers in their broadest form 
have an impact on students for good and for bad from from your first teachers from your those who raise you um those who those who help teach you initially who are very important to to school teachers and professors and things things of that nature is that teachers truly have an impact on students <laughs> in the broadest sense on on their mental health on their learning on who they grow to be as people um and so i think I thank all the panelists here for for being teachers <laughs> and for taking that mantle upon themselves and 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 all those who are who are watching this teachers administrators all those contributing to this experience that they uh, and and parents too uh, or, or people who are raising helping raise children um, that they are willing to take that mantle upon themselves to be able to to shape who people like me and people like Israel. Um, are and and so I, I really appreciate that and i think i thank all of you guys yeah well thank you max and thank you israel and brooke and amy and jared and robert mandy nate and lion and thanks to all of you for participating i'm sorry i couldn't see the chat i couldn't see questions so i i assume that uh, that, that was going on as well Many of the teachers here are on Twitter, so you can interact with them there. And I really want to thank the Washington State Legislative Youth Advisory Council for your participation and your partnership. The website, by the way, is walyac, L-Y-A-C dot org. Our next confirmed webinar is Wednesday, October 27th. In this webinar, Centering Student Voices, we have assembled a statewide panel of students, educators, and community leaders to discuss the impacts of racially motivated violence, presenting tools that can be used in schools to best support students on a daily basis and provide educators with appropriate skills to create well-rounded, historically accurate curricula. You can register by visiting our website, educationvoters.org, and clicking on events, then lunchtime webinars. I'll also send registration information in the follow-up email, which you should receive in about 24 hours. And next Thursday, October 7th, please join us for our statewide free virtual event focused on supporting students impacted by COVID. First, we'll hear from former U.S. Education Secretary, Dr. John B. King Jr., President of the Education Trust, and Dr. Vin Gupta, public health physician, professor, health policy expert, and regular health policy analyst for NBC News, MSNBC, and contributor to the New York Times and CNN. They'll explore the academic and mental health impacts on students during the pandemic. 2022 Washington State Teacher of the Year, Jared Keck will also be with us. And then join us as we break into groups to discuss how we can support students across Washington State moving forward. That registration link is on our website, educationvoters.org. Just click on events. I'll also share that information in the follow-up email, which will get to your inbox in about 24 hours. Special thanks to our community leader sponsors, Microsoft, Boeing, the Puyallup Tribe, and Group Health Foundation. And thank you to each of you for joining us today. If you have additional questions or comments, please send them to me at eric, A-R-I-K, at educationvoters.org. A recording of today's presentation will be available on our website, educationvoters.org, and will be sent to you in the follow-up email. Please feel free to share the recording with your friends and colleagues. If you'd like to learn more about League of Education Voters or support our work, please visit our website, educationvoters.org. Thank you again for attending. Each one of us has the right to feel safe and valued. Together, we will fight for a world in which true educational and economic equity exists. We look forward to seeing you at future webinars. Israel, Max, Jared, Brooke, Amy, Robert, Mandy, Nate, Lion, thank you again for joining us. And thank you for all you do for Washington students and families. I hope you have a great rest of your week. <laughs>